because you would be inter- like people would be interested in knowing that uh, what's happening is that now encryption is available as a service so you can buy for like 25 25 you can buy encryption as a service you can download the tools and create uh, a ransomware kind of a kit and then you can actually deploy package and all those things and then send it out to people so they will fall victim so i would say that ransomware attacks are definitely uh, having multiple impact like one is social engineering then having proper security awareness for uh, employees and then all of us like all of us should should always be up to date about what are the new techniques happening so even in phishing or like ransomware which is being sent as an email attachment and stuff like that so phishing people let's say like there is a 100 employee organization and this 100 employee organization all of them are getting similar kind of phishing email they would go to the canteen or they would go to the cafeteria when they are having a coffee break and they would chat with each other and they would say that hey so someone from uh, finance would speak with someone in marketing and they would discuss hey i got an email like this did you also get so that actually prevent so hackers are like phishing campaign creators so these are campaigns so social like social media campaigns phishing runs on campaigns so this phishing campaign creators will actually see that they are not going to send similar email to the people in the same department or even in uh, departments where they interact they won't send so they will send something to someone in sales and then similar email to someone in finance if they are not going to speak to each other then they may they may fall victim to the same trap and that's how it happens so the key thing for any ransomware is don't click anything which you feel suspicious if if it is too good to be true it is not true so then don't fall victim to that and the other thing is like having a proper backup strategy like if you are not taking regular backup then you are being falling a uh, victim for any kind of ransomware attack then you cannot recover from that and then paying money for any ransomware or a crypto ransomware to get a key and all those things is not a solution because the moment you start paying for that uh, the people who actually create this ransomware attacks will definitely know that you are willing to pay more and more and they can increase the stakes in the game and that is what which happened so the thing is having a proper security hygiene having a regular security awareness and making sure that uh, phishing spear phishing or wishing based even if you are getting some calls like uh, it may be coming as a blank call there is no point in saying hello 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 if you don't know the voice on the other end if the other end is silent and they are not speaking anything there is no point in saying hello because when you say hello that is an opportunity for the person on the other end to capture your voice sample because then that becomes easier because i do work in the radio industry as well i am a part time rj as well so i know that manipulating voice and recording voice and all those things it is pretty pretty much a click of a button so don't fall victim to that voice based attacks as well so it's it's a mix of all those things so i would just stop there I don't know. We we lost Anay. Anay, you might be on mute. But while uh, Anay is joining, I think uh, Sangam very well put. Very well put there, right? Uh, it's not just about the technology anymore. I I truly believe, right? Our people and our employees are new periphery, which hackers are kind of trying to breach, right? It's not about just uh, uh, breaking those firewalls, but these people are kind of new periphery. So so that's the kind of new reality. And thanks a lot for sharing that perspective. Uh, Achal, how about you? Right, any specific thoughts from your side uh, that you want to share while Anay joins back? Am I audible, folks? Yeah. Yes, you're back. Yes, you're back. Yeah, I think we lost uh, Anchal. Yeah, I think we lost. Uh, I'm trying to connect to the background. Okay. So, uh, I think Sangam, you've uh, put forward your thoughts in a in a very uh, correct way, and I mean. this is where uh, people would look at your your interest right and how you would be interested in uh, different things as you said right ipl example if i am passionate about something probably i'll I, i'll be more uh, prone to opening a mail which comes on a similar topic and that is where philip also mentioned artificial intelligence which comes in uh, as a part of cyber attacks which are happening so uh anchal am i audible to you can you hear me yes i can hear you now thank you 
Okay, so uh, uh, if I may ask, I mean, in terms of uh, the business continuity, right? You have a, a great experience on business continuity side of it, right? So how business continuity professionals contribute to the cyber resiliency programs of an organization? I mean, I know business continuity goes hands in hand with, with the, the cyber recovery or in case of a ransomware attack, you have to plan your DCP. So if you would maybe share your experience, how it goes hand in hand, please. Sure. So, um, so Anya, as you mentioned, it is now, you know, we are seeing the boundaries getting delineated now. There are more people are coming on board to work together, which is, I think, uh, was always the basis of business continuity. We work with everyone in the organization and uh, in the government services when we, you know, kind of collaborate with the government outside the organization. But then um, from a cyber, uh, cyber uh, resiliency point of view, uh, are the benefits that we bring to the table, the business continuity world brings to the table is first preparedness, defense in terms of defense, and then, you know, response and recovery. So we, we've been, uh, you know, uh, business continuity people have been traditionally doing response and recovery for a long time now. And we bring that experience to the table wherein we can help organizations build strong reactions strong uh, response to how to handle an attack and and also how to recover quickly from the attack. So, uh, you know, as uh, they just said that we are looking at a very big number in terms of dollar value when a, an attack happens, we are also looking at something of an emotional, uh, you know, response coming from people and both needs to be addressed. I'm sure there are other aspects to it as well, but then, uh, you know, all of all of these aspects have to come together, work together and uh, be addressed. So that is one aspect where uh, business continuity uh, contributes. Then uh, another aspect that we see is right at the beginning when we do our business impact analysis, we can, the question that we've been asking uh, so far has been how critical, what are your critical processes and what is the critical technology and people who support these processes so that business can recover quickly and get online. What do I need to keep my lights on basically has been the question. Now I've seen the trend, we are seeing continuous shift in that trend to say, to include data into our conversations. So we are saying, we are asking, what is the critical data you have today? How, and, and how do you want to protect it first? And second, how quickly do you want to recover it? And that is where you know the, the different aspects of, of recovery comes in from a cyber resilience program. And the third very big area that I think uh, business continuity managers all over the world are supporting this, uh, this uh, uh, program is uh, bringing up the conversation and making it a board level conversation. So I have seen uh, you know, business continuity professionals across the globe build these scenarios, build the cyber attack scenarios into their crisis management exercises. And when they go from that aspect and ask from senior management that what is your preparedness today? It kind of you know, gives a totally different spectrum to how you want to address it. And what criticality do you want to you know, put, put on it? And as a result, we are seeing uh, not just management commitment coming onto the table, but we are also seeing budgets being allocated specifically for cyber resiliency programs. So that is, uh, you know, that is a very big shift that happens within the organization with a very simple exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with your uh, viewpoints because even though it was not part of any of the exercises, like organizations are realizing that DR exercises should definitely be uh, part of that and BCP should be part of like you should have different scenarios and you should definitely test. So what happens if you don't test and then some disaster happens and then you cannot recover, you cannot restore and then you cannot continue the business uh, business process uh, then that's a failure on the planning part. So well said. Thanks, Sargam. Uh, Philip, you want to add anything because we, we hear a lot of time in the industry that uh, you have a sound disaster recovery process, but how about having a process which also covers cyber recovery with disaster recovery, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll ask you and then move on to Tejas also on a similar thought. Is CR strategy as important as DR and how should 
companies look at CR uh, as good as DR process. Um, so I don't want to differentiate between the CR and the DR. Uh, what I wanted to resonate with Anjil's point is that, you know, today it is not an IT problem. It is not a, I mean, a security team's problem. It is not a, uh, not a problem of the IT department. It is a board level problem today, for sure. Especially for large organizations, the board level problem. Two, three reasons. Because, um, you know, after the Sony attack, if you see, uh, uh, you know, many of the companies, board of directors and the CXO level people had to step down because of cyber attacks. And that is real. So your share values are going down, reputations are getting damaged, uh, you know, your productions are going down, you're, you're having legal implications. You can see that European Union already fined multiple big, big fines to very, very big companies. And that is equal to multiple companies turnover together, right? So that means definitely it is a board level problem. Now, uh, the, the thing is that it is an ecosystem driven problem. So you cannot, you cannot ensure that, I mean, you cannot be ensure that your organization is very safe when your partner ecosystem is not safe and secure. For example, the companies you are doing merger and acquisitions, right? Uh, large companies do a lot of M&A. Now you may have a very, very uh, high matured cyber resiliency, uh, you know, uh, maturity level score and, you know, all the DR, I mean, uh, everything near DR, everything is available in place, right? But what happens if you're you're on one of your sister concerns, which is integrated your own core operations that are OT and IT and many other aspects, is getting breached. And that is MEDOC is a simple example, right? One through one PDF, it can kill the whole chain. So uh, that is where a partner ecosystem is going to be extremely important. Your third party risk is coming very, very important nowadays uh, because your software vendor, it can be, or it can be a supply chain partner, or it can be simple contract employees you're on onboarding to your organization. So third party risk. Your organizational, uh, you know, sister concerns or other or enterprises, you know, which are under your uh, parent company, all these things are getting, uh, uh, you know, important, uh, important, and that is getting to the ecosystem, and that is why board is driving because they have seen that the real impact on the share values and the reputation and the legal implications as an organization at a big time. Uh, so uh, there is a, there is a, uh, I think what I've seen is actually there is a bit of mindset change people started realizing that it is not a technology problem, it's a cultural problem. And this is where ecosystem has to come together. And uh, it is applicable not only at the board level, not only at the senior technology executive level, it is applicable at the gate security level itself, right? Or even at the receptionist, because somebody can come and post like an interview candidate and um, he can create a story in the back and that, okay, I have a scheduled appointment for my interview today. And uh, on the way, my CV got spilled with tea, I mean, uh, some tea. Can you take me a printout? And when the receptionist looks at the calendar, yeah, there is an interview scheduled and uh, she will be happily giving a, a printout for that particular candidate, right? And immediately after six months, you see that your four of your factories are shutting down or your know, entire operations are getting destroyed. So this is where that ecosystem has to come together. And it is a, it is not a one particular uh, team or technology responsibility. It is a collective responsibility to make it safer and better. Uh, thanks, Philip. And uh, maybe uh, I move on to Tejas. Uh, based on your experience, right, uh, we've heard so, about, so much about the importance of having a cyber recovery uh, solution in an organization. And uh, we discussed about uh, the impact which ransomware can have, right? What do you think are some of the proactive cyber resiliency uh, measures which can be taken by the organization? Uh, to protect at least the business critical data, we call crown jewels to the business, right? So, what what are those measures? Uh, based Absolutely, and I and again, right? I think I think I'll start with agreeing with uh, Philip on one thing and then disagreeing on one more, right? So so I completely agree with Philip in terms of it's no longer a single department or single team. Earlier, we used to say that like, and, and again, right, to earlier point of Anshul as well. And so so amazing and refreshing to have Anshul who is representing the business continuity saying that like how all those departments are working together. It's, it's a music to our ear, especially being a data production product engineering guy, right? Uh, I remember there was a time like maybe not many years ago where you will say that like all of the responsibility of uh, securing a data or securing the company against those kind of this kind of attacks it's always sole responsibility of that uh, CISO or chief security officer right and everybody else is like happy and if there's something goes wrong kill that guy right <laughs> not literally but then uh, blame that guy right that's how it, 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 it used to be but to Philip's point I think now everybody's understanding that it's an ecosystem and it's an ecosystem 
outside the organization as well as the ecosystem inside the organization so uh, if i if i reflect right over last uh, uh, one and a half year i am attending more and more meetings where i will have not only the the cso or chief security officer in the room but you will also have cio you will also have cto or chief data officer as well as you will have the uh, the chief risk officer who might be looking at the overall business continuity plan for the entire company and they all are together in this uh, kind of a overall building the proactive cyber resiliency plan right but that that has to happen at a board level and that's how it's kind of a uh, happening overall so that's kind of more on the coordination part now if we come and kind of a click down right so why it's kind of becoming so important i think it all boils down to the fact we heard a lot how easy it can be for somebody to to philips point right just to carry that 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 pen drive and kind of a uh, get uh, four or five of your factory closed down few months later right it's it's pretty pretty easy nowadays so in nutshell it's not a matter of if anymore people use people used to say like if i get attacked it's it's not a matter of if anymore it's just the question of when you will be attacked right and i think i think that's where it's important for us to have the right proactiveness and and right uh, kind of a cyber resilience in place uh uh sangam uh, uh, touched upon this briefly that like naturally you would need to have right backup and recovery solutions right you want to have those uh, rto rpo in place and have the right infrastructure uh, uh to kind of make sure that like you have the backup and recovery solutions so that like if something happens you can recover from that backup now we all know this do we do we wonder that uh, the the cyber attackers or hackers don't know it heck they know it they know it that like any any time any system gets uh, attacked or production system is hacked we going to turn to our backup so now they are increasingly kind of going behind your backups and uh, overall uh, recovery solutions so that like you can't recover and that's where they get their chance to pay it, either get paid for ransom or they can destroy your data just for a hack of it or fun of it right so unfortunately now the point here is right there are a number of this vulnerable points that we might have into the backup and recovery solution because they are not designed for this very specific use case of cyber attack right and that's where there might be some of the points where there are vulnerability and that's why like as a industry as a cyber security experts and leaders right we all recommend now that like every business should evaluate that uh, offline air gapped copies of data which will help you god forbid something goes wrong and as i, as I said again it's a matter of when right so that's kind of very important the second thing also is i don't believe still we have the clear mandates from governments or industry bodies i know some of the industry bodies are taking uh, taking a kind of a leap there but then most of the countries and industry bodies they don't have clear mandate but looking at this entire uh, landscape of ransomware it's it's kind of responsibility of each and every one of us right to make sure that like we are being proactive into kind of uh, uh, protecting our data we are making sure again right protecting the copies of our critical data we have to isolate in in isolated manner right or providing that kind of right isolated uh, a framework there and that's where we provide a recovery point if those uh, attacks happen and last but not the least guys philip touched on this very well everyone needs to be educated throughout the company because it's imperative that more likely than not they will try to exploit someone or an employee uh, some specific person or employee error to kind of initiate this attack so in summary i guess uh, uh, you need to find that end to end solution which is work at a board level right uh, your technology solution should be smart and automated backed up with your educated people or employees behind and it's very important also for us to keep checking or kind of having that drill uh quarterly or even more frequently right those are kind of some of the important points that you definitely want to keep in mind um uh, hi hi probably if i could just add and uh, give you one a latest update on one of the claims what we had done in the beginning of the session um you know we talked about every 37 seconds there is an attack right uh, just now i got a news that um uh, scott uh, morrison the prime minister of australia just revealed uh, that the entire government uh, and uh, major business units are hit by a massive cyber attack from sophisticated state based actor 
So I just received uh, that. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, give you uh, uh, one or two points in relevant to this because why it is at board level. Uh, uh, there is another reason uh, because earlier, you know, people were targeting the data, especially on data breaches. They want to monetize the data and leverage the data for making money out of this, the financial motive. And slowly, if you see the shift, it has slowly started to getting into disruption, not only just the monetization part, the disruption side of it. And now if you see, uh, really it is going to get into destruction. And uh, the attacks, when there are 3000 attacks per day, uh, minimum, which are, which are very well planned organized attacks are happening. How many, how many of you, I mean, how many of the attacks can be prevented by us, right? So uh, what I uh, personally see that now organizations should start, it, start seeing not only, not just securing the entire end-to-end -end aspect of uh, their, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, systems, but quality system. They have to identify which are the assets to be protected, which are, and that is, that should be based on qualified threat intelligence because uh, the tools and technologies are evolving, the process and the capabilities are evolving, and everybody knows that the companies are getting mature to back up their data, move into more secured uh, environment. These threat actors and threat groups, the, the cyber criminals and criminal group, they'll be developing the sophisticated weapons, right? And they'll be targeting specific vulnerabilities and specific um, you know, malware for specific industry based on specific use cases. Now we need to understand that for each of the industry, for each of the uh, region, what is relevant for them and what is what are their critical crown jewels and they need to ensure that that is protected first because um, why I am saying this because if you look at by in the next five years, we are going to have 50 billion connected devices coming to the world. As for POPs, again, POPs research, it's all available in the public information. 50 billion connected devices means 50 billion entry points for cyber criminals to get inside your organization and that can be happening through our own a uh, smart TV, which I kept in my bedroom yeah. and they can get into my organization today. And it is proven, right? The ring CCTV camera in the US too. The, the smart TV attack uh, in Kerala where uh, women's, uh, you know, naked pictures were stolen through the smart TV in Kerala. This, this, oh, there are so many examples how this connected systems can be used. So now more than the quantity, the quality has to be looked at and people have to be looking at um, you know, destruct. I mean, data breach to dist uh, disruption to destruction, and three things. What I I I personally be, be, uh, feel that which can companies can adopt. One, uh, I don't know how many of you started practicing the zero trust model. So there is something called zero trust. You cannot trust anybody for that matter, whether it is chairman to or uh, you know gatekeeper. You cannot trust anybody. So yeah, you can it can be your father, mother, or wife and son. Doesn't matter. Zero trust model. Have a zero trust model. That is one precaution somebody can adopt. Second one the basics and foundations. So we may have the sophisticated process technology and tools and what is where some of these most uh, simple attacks are happening at, at the basics and foundation level. So ensure that the basics and foundations are there, zero trust model, and ensure that the ecosystem is considered into that whole program uh, management, right? Because it is a shared responsibility. It is an individual responsibility as well as a shared responsibility. I think these are the points I want to share in addition to uh, the current scenario and in the light of this new example just came from the Australian attack. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, Phyllis, add... Philip, and, and just just to make sure, right? I think I think my disagreement with you is gone now because this is what I was kind of getting to as because many times you can find those generic solution, but as Philip put it, right, some of the security scenarios are very specific to your own business, and that's where you have to be specific about that. So so it may not be the kind of a generic DR or disaster recovery solution which are kind of a, available in the market will protect you, and that's where the cyber uh, resiliency comes into a play. So very well put. Philip, yeah, even example. policies, even yeah. policies won't help you because uh, uh, you know, for example, the the target attack. Target was a PCI compliant organization, but still target could reach right from a data perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the target attack, they, they actually get got inside through the HVAC technician. So this is like one of those people in the entire kill chain, right? So the kill chain, we call it as a kill chain. So the kill chain, all employees, like all human beings, like. Human beings are still the weakest, weakest link in the security chain. So that is very well acknowledged, but still people don't give enough importance to that. And just to add to one of Philip's point that most of the connected device, I was reading like last week online that most of the connected device, their device root CAs are getting expired by late this year. So if they don't get updated, they will lose connectivity to their manufacturer's network. So this is something which uh, all connected device manufacturers are thinking about. Roku just issued a device update where they are updating the root CAs and stuff like that. So this is like 
connected devices yes, they are smart but the problem with that is like if you don't know like how much smart they are and if we are leaving any loose ends open then that is going to be the start of the next era where the machines are becoming much more intelligent so the other thing to keep in mind is like uh, the cognitive cybersecurity where artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to uh, bridge that gap of like we cannot go through 3000 lines of code by line by line and then see what's going on or going by the security logs and see whether there is any any attack happening so those kind of predictive modeling as well as machine learning artificial intelligence that is going to definitely change uh, it's already started to change but going forward in the next decade that is going to make a significant leap thank you so much i think uh, very well summarized and i am so happy to see panel so very well connected on the topic because i think uh, we we know we understand the the entire scenario but since we bought connected devices and uh, this is a question to sangam uh, on more towards connected devices right with work from home coming in uh, there are more connected devices than ever right so how an organization can ensure that uh, even if the employee is accessing the data which is important for day to day work and the corporate data uh, how they can ensure that the security is not compromised and the, the follow up question would be uh, in case there is a data loss i mean it even matters more because everyone is working from home so what is the impact of data loss when an employee is working from home so yeah yeah sure because in this unprecedented time like we are seeing something which we have never seen in our entire life right like large massive workforce working from home and all this like newer concepts like organizations are running to get their hardware in so that remote access can be enabled and stuff like that so that is where the cloud based access or cloud based remote access is going to change that as well as bridge the gap so how that happens is like now employees like almost all employees unless the essential employees most of them are working from home so you need to make sure like uh, exactly like how philip put the zero trust model so zero trust model don't trust anyone and then make sure that they have the right access so the right access can be done on the cloud itself like the entry point because now the traditional perimeter is uh, is getting disappeared so because employees are sitting at home and then they are working so the home becomes their perimeter and the cloud becomes the entry point into the organization's uh, cloud based data center or on prem data center so what happens is that where you deploy the policies now when you deploy the policy are you controlling whether the employees are accessing the apps which you want them to access or they are using the corporate resources for doing something else so all this monitoring all those policies and all those things has to be set properly for any kind of remote access like it could be a vpn based access or it could be a cloud based uh, firewall servers and stuff like that so you can control and you can put all those things on top of it now from a data loss prevention perspective uh, we have to think about two things like data in motion as well as data at end point now the data in motion is when the employees are trying to upload something onto a saas application or something to be downloaded from a corporate server through the cloud when they get connected over a remote access and all those things so that needs to be uh, controlled or they are trying to send something as an email attachment so email attachment is one of the largest uh, exfiltration vector from any organization for siphoning of uh, intellectual properties or confidential information so that becomes a key concern uh, and endpoint like where the data at endpoint like we call that uh, data at rest as well so the data at rest or data at endpoint is also of importance because then we don't know what the employees are downloading onto their local machine like working from home and then whether that document is a classified document it whether it should be allowed to be copied uh, to a usb drive or to be another uh, network share or within their file sharing within the home network and stuff like that so that needs to be constantly monitored so that can be done using an endpoint agent or on the data in motion piece then it can be done at the cloud level where there is a transaction happening or whether there is a, any kind of traffic happening and then that traffic needs to be monitored on the cloud itself so that's how it happens and then on the saas storage this is another key concern because then the employees might be accessing both sanctioned applications as well as unsanctioned applications let's take an example like uh, for for example a company might be authorizing office 365 the enterprise version for 
uh, accessing and OneDrive to be used for storage and sharing of information. So what happens like nowadays, like anyone can buy a OneDrive, uh, a OneDrive subscription or an Office 365 subscription, the retail or the consumer version, and they can use it for uploading information. So what people can do is like what employees can do is like if they want to uh, take information from the uh, enterprise, what they can do is they can download the information from the corporate instance and then upload to their uh, retail or consumer instance. So the data gets moved there, or even if they are uploading information to the enterprise version of uh, Office 365 or Box or Google Drive, are they sharing it with the right entities or are they sharing it with any risky domains and stuff like that? Are they sharing it with some personal Gmail or Yahoo or any of those kind of personal emails and stuff like that. So we need to find out all these things. So a data loss prevention works at different level and data loss prevention is 90% process and 10% technology or maybe 80% process and 20% technology. There also the process has to be changed and then the incident response for any kind of data loss, how it has to be handled. It has to be well documented and well acknowledged by each and every employee of the organization. And any DLP solution has to be a disruptive. When we say a disruptive solution, it needs to mention, like, let's say an employee is trying to copy some confidential information onto a USB drive. So if they get a pop-up, it's saying that this is not according to the corporate policy. You are trying to copy something which is classified as confidential. Do you have the authorization to do? If you don't have authorization, then you cannot copy. So it makes it makes sure that the employee behavior also changes. So any kind of DLP solution over a period of time, the number of incidents and the number of alerts reported to the help desk or the SOC will be coming down over a period of time because then people will know that this is confidential, this is uh, top secret, this is a public information which can be shared. So that all those things have to be taken in consideration. So D DLP comprises of like data at rest. Uh, data, uh, data at rest also does for the SaaS storage as well as for endpoints. And then data in motion is the most important thing where people are trying to send as an email attachment or upload to um, a file storage, uh, file storage site on any of the SaaS hosted applications and stuff like that. So DLP is one of those key concerns with this remote working because going forward, if this becomes the new mandate, like uh, most organizations are deciding because with this current condition, like uh, all the organizations are seeing that there is an increase in productivity because people are working more and then they are getting more and then less commute being more green because we are not uh, creating a problem. There is no more traffic on the streets and stuff like that. And uh, companies may realize that they are not paying for the bandwidth and they don't need to uh, spend on expensive real estate and stuff like that. So basically the productivity is definitely improving because if I'm working from home, I'm not stopping my work from, uh, I'm not uh, stopping my work at five and uh, starting at nine, right? So yeah, I get extended working hours and stuff like that. So the productivity is definitely increasing, but that personal interaction, like uh, when we do face-to-face -face meetings and stuff like that, it becomes a challenge because working remote has its own challenges and then working in an office kind of an environment has its own challenges as well. Thanks, Agam. And I, I mean, on, on a similar uh, note, I mean, Philip, do you want to add something uh, in a connected world, how the best measures should be taken on the security side of it? I mean, we cannot uh, stop an employee to access the business critical data because this is key to the business. But then again, make sure that uh, the organization is secure and the measurements are uh, for future as well, right? Because you will see more and more connected devices coming in, as we, as we said. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I, I wanted to add a couple of things. One, um, you know, uh, it, it, for a small organization, a big organization, doesn't matter. Everybody is a target for attack. It's a matter of time. And uh, in that one, make sure that we have the fundamentals and foundational principles, and not only documented in policy documents, but practiced on the ground, right? That is a very, very need of the world, which is unfortunately may missing because of the various priorities. Yes, are we compliant on these, these regulations and policies? Yes, but at, at the end of the day, still attacks happen because the practice part is missing, right? Um, to ensure that the foundations and fundamentals are in place. Second thing, what I would like to again um, uh, recommend is uh, to leverage threat intelligence. Uh, this is connecting to one of my previous, uh, uh, you know, uh, thought, what I shared. 
the cyber criminals and criminal groups they are going to have targeted attacks because they they know that you know systems are getting matured even at the organization level so the entry is not that easy right so they'll be developing targeted uh, uh, you know exploits and tools and technologies this is where threat intelligence will be exceptionally and extremely important and you need to ensure that we leverage threat intelligence and uh, move in move in from a reactive response to a proactive defense model right so and this is where we would need to understand uh, who are the adversaries right adversaries are like there could be a hacktivist uh, they may, they may not have any other agenda other than proving a point there could be a real cyber criminal with a kind of a um, uh, uh, you know financial motive or it can be state sponsored uh, attacks or it can be insider threats so 62% of the attacks are happening because of an insider how many people know that right so that these are different adversaries we need to know that who are these adversaries and then what kind of uh, you know assets they would be targeting they are targeted it can be infrastructure ip address it can be domain it can be applications it can be technology we should be very clear and the third one we should be knowing how they are going to attack these uh, you know assets or infrastructure and things like that what kind of malware what kind of exploits what kind of tools and technologies what kind of stolen certificates are available another thing we need to know about ttps techniques tactics and procedures they will be using for launching attack and the last one is who can be the victim in the whole chain right it can be an end user it can be a critical infrastructure it can be an intellectual property it can be a confidential data what is the target right if you have a connected diagram of these four things definitely i think uh, really companies would be able to increase their uh, you know cyber risk posture and uh, they can i think they should most of the companies irrespective of big or small people should start looking into threat intelligence is one key and there are many paid and open source tools available there axenger itself high defense intelgraph semantic deep site ibm x force anomaly threat stream palo alto autofocus there are so many op, uh, you know paid sources and at the same time there are so many open source threat intelligence suites as well right a virus total to you know abyss.cs to you know fba has the nvd there are so many open source uh, threat intelligence is available ensure that this intelligence is contextualized and you take actions based on your business scenario and the context and then proactively defend rather than reactively response is my suggestion and for that ensure that fundamentals and foundations are in place and practiced and with a zero trust model that is what my recommendation yeah i see that uh, there is a, a question by jayshri malever asking about is cloud storage safe to be used so uh, i would give my response to that like cloud storage is safe to be used but uh, you have to take uh, appropriate uh, precautions like what kind of information you are going to upload and put those security controls around that so most of the organizations they will clearly mandate that don't use any public cloud storage for sharing of source code or confidential information and stuff like that so that is very much valid so if you are uploading your confidential information onto a cloud storage like i'm just taking names like google drive or one drive or box or dropbox or any of these things make sure that you have a strong password protection have multi factor turned on and these are some of the security practices and have regular and don't share the root folder or don't share the parent folder with uh, people whom uh, like if you want to share a specific file yes you sp uh, share that specific file because most of the time when we do a security audit what we see on this kind of cloud based storage is that the parent folder is publicly shared and then you share the child folders to specific groups but nobody realizes that the since the parent folder is publicly shared everything is a free access so you have to be very clear about what kind of information you are going to upload to the box or the cloud storage uh, i would like to add one more point there um, in the con uh, in the current uh, pandemic uh, covid situation right most of the companies industries are having severe difficulties in in their business so most of the companies will be forced to you know have opex based uh, investments and that is where cloud adoption will go very high uh, in my personal view what i see is actually whether it is a cloud or on premise it's all about again are we are we having the fundamentals and foundations in place inside the cloud also we need to ensure that your data security or data protection data leakage prevention policies are enforced inside the cloud also you need to ensure that the patching and the configurations are done inside the cloud also you need to ensure that your identity access management uh, you know policies are enforced including identity governance and uh, entitlements right otherwise what will happen end of the day it is another infrastructure so uh, on the other side 
I feel sometimes cloud itself is giving you more safety because inside the cloud there are hundreds or thousands of organizations, right? It is going to be very difficult for a cyber criminal to go and target one company and then launch attack. But it has plus and minus as well. Uh, the point what I want to raise here is actually if we miss the fundamentals and foundations uh, missing practice, the practice is missing whether it's on premise or cloud, it is vulnerable. Yeah, let Absolutely. me address uh, one of uh, Surbi's uh, question. So. I did not mean that there is no security on the cloud. There is definitely security on the cloud. It is up to the consumer to set up those security in the right way because they give a lot of options. It's less like a supermarket. So you go to a supermarket, you can buy a toothpaste and then come back, or you can buy multiple things and come back. So this is like that. So you need to be clear about what all you need. If you're signing an agreement with a SaaS provider, you need to make sure that this is as from an organization perspective, you need to make sure that whether you are turning on multi-factor, what kind of protection, are they going to whitelist specific series of IPs from where you are go, you, you are permitted to access that SaaS application, or are they going to enable single sign-on where the, where, the where the employees go to a single sign-on portal and from there only they can get uh, authorized and authenticated and from there they get access to those applications and stuff like that. So those are different configuration options. So cloud is secure. So what I meant was, if you don't know how to get it secure, then cloud is not safe. Then you will just upload it without having those uh, different security controls. So then anyone would be able to access it pretty much easily. So that's what I meant. Yeah. Absolutely, and just to add, I think I think there is a lot of reaction coming on that, right? So, uh, so, so I I will I'll go with like the, the points that Philip was raising, and Sangam just clarified as well. Just to add more, guys, right? It's not that like cloud is good or bad. It's it's the way you use it and the way you put your practices on top. So, if you are planning to use uh, cloud as your cyber resilience copy, you will need those technology solution in that manner, which are. Uh, uh, supported by rest of the processes to ensure that like your data uh, is safe in that right so so that's kind of pretty important and uh, it's 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 easy to kind of guess that like uh, my cloud provider will will take care of it and many times those assumptions are made but believe me guys i have read those cloud contracts first to last word none of them take any responsibility for something which get gets breached especially from outside their infrastructure believe me on this one and for that it's you who are responsible. And I, I think we're gonna run out of time, but then there is a lot of technology and research happen there. You want that very, very balanced approach when you are creating your cyber resiliency in terms of your on-prem infrastructure, your off-prem copies, and how you're gonna, gonna manage it together, right? And that's where cyber recovery kind of uh, overall uh, approach, end-to-end -end cyber, cyber resilience approach with the cyber recovery ability comes into a play. So that's what I would like to say. Yeah, and I would just like to add, you know, assumptions and presumptions are good, but it is always good to ask the questions and get get educated and clarify clarity into the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is no uh, hard and fast rules or statements which, say, which says cloud is unsafe or cloud is more safe. Cloud, is, cloud could be as good as your on-prem because the biggest advantage of cloud is that it is elastic in nature. And then as and when the organization grows, it gives a lot of flexibility in that growth and then all those things. And you don't need to ramp up. Uh, if you need to ramp up rapidly, you don't need to invest on that. So you can definitely go on an OPEX-based uh, model. So that means there is no upfront investment. So you have to make sure. So the only thing is it has to be customized because there is no, uh, like it's not like a single, uh, single size can fit all uh, uh, all different kind of requirements. So that is not uh, that is not valid. So you have to be very clear about what is the organizational requirement and what kind of security is offered by the SaaS vendor. If the SaaS vendor is not giving enough security, then what you can do is you can have a remote access based security so that you will be whitelisting only a series of maybe 10 or 15 IPs. That will make sure, ensure that the employees are accessing uh, those SaaS applications through the corporate network or through the corporate data center and backhauling and all those things. So there are different technologies which can definitely be used. And then make sure that only those channels are getting connected. And then you get push notification. You can have a Microsoft Authenticator. You can use Opta, Ping ID, Duo. So there are different kinds of multi-factor authentication mechanisms which are there in the market. So all those things can be used. And 
based on the risk, you can have a step up authentication or a step down authentication. If you see a suspicious login attempt from a specific employee, like this, we call this as a Superman travel. Employee is in India, but within minutes, he is trying to access from Shanghai, something wrong. So those kind of uh, fraud detection and any kind of uh, password getting compromised and trying to log in from two different locations. So all those things can be put together and then make, make sure that uh, the cloud itself is, can be uh, consumed in a much more secure way. So much, dear panelists. Okay, uh, I think there are many questions coming up. But probably we can ask uh, answer it offline. I'll send all the questions across. So we can answer it and send it back because we'll have to start the next session in four minutes. So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for taking your time out and uh, giving your insights here. It was really an amazing panel. Thank you so much, Mr. Tejas, Mr. Sangameshwaran, Anshul, Anshul ma'am, Philip sir and uh, Mr. Anai, it was really a great panel and it was a pleasure having you with us. I'm sure our audience had a lot to learn from. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I request the audience to go back to the main conference center and attend the other expos and uh, conferences that are live. Thank you. <laughs>